All right, it is nine o'clock on a Wednesday. It must mean it's time for the Penn State Alumni Association's coffee hour. I see the Zoom room is filling up. Go ahead and let us know who you are and where you're from. Happy Thanksgiving to all. We look forward to today's program. We're gonna visit with Ashley Romaine in just a couple of moments. She's an artist, a creator, a producer, and we look forward to sharing her story with you in just a couple of minutes. If you are looking to use our closed captions, you can find those instructions in the Zoom chat window. Uh, or if you're tuning in on Facebook Live, welcome to our guests out on Facebook. Go ahead and check out the instructions for how to customize your caption experience on Facebook in the comments on Facebook Live as well. I see Pete Sheridan out in Blandon, Pennsylvania, class of 98. Good to see you again, sir. A regular here on Coffee Hour, Paul McConaughey, class of 60, Cape Cod. Back up in Cape Cod, it looks like, not here in State College. Happy Thanksgiving to all who are joining us. Go ahead and let us know who you are and where you're from. We'll be getting started in just a moment. We have a great coffee hour lined up for you this morning with Ashley Romaine. I see Tanya Seifert, Springfield, Virginia. Welcome in. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and welcome to the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Each week on Coffee Hour, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. As a reminder, we are recording this session and closed captions are available for this event. You can find the information in the chat in Zoom or in the comments in Facebook. Today we are talking to producer and artist Ashley Romaine. Ashley is a TV and digital video producer who produces lifestyle, cooking, travel, archive documentary and news, and talk show content across various media networks. When not producing, she's using her Penn State art degree to draw and paint, often moments inspired by the stories she's produced or current topics in our client. She sells prints and her originals online and we'll be sharing uh, that information in the chat so you can check out all of Ashley's great work. I'm excited to welcome Ashley Romaine to Coffee Hour. Ashley, good morning. Hi Paul, good morning, how are you? I am fantastic. Tell everyone where you're joining us from this morning. I'm in Queens in Astoria, New York. So I have not left the city, I'm staying right here. <laughs> all right, a great place to hunker down for the holidays. Let's start right at the very beginning and talk about how you became a Penn State Nittany Lion. Well, it's it's kind of a funny story. I applied to 13 colleges um, my mm. senior um, year of high school because I was just so nervous. Like, what if I don't get into one? I need a backup because I'm that type of person who needs like 50 backup plans. Um, and Penn State was one of the schools. I got into actually a lot of the schools that I applied to. Um, but Penn State was one of them. So I went to visit a couple of the different campuses. And then I also went to visit University Park and it was like a really rainy day. Um, so my parents were like, okay, well, let's see if we can, you know, go on a tour somewhere. Um, all the tours were closed. I didn't realize you had to make those appointments in advance. <laughs> Poor <Right. point. laughs> so then they're like, well, it's raining, but do you want to get out and walk? And I was like, no, let's just do one loop around. We did like one loop around East. And I was like, this seems like a really cool place. Um, I don't know. I, I get like, I, I go off of like feelings of a place and I, just like seeing people walking around, you can tell how happy everyone is in Happy Valley. Um, and that's genuinely the story about how I became a Penn Stater. <laughs> that's amazing. You know, that uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people will say 
uh, I applied to a lot of places and, and I stepped on campus and I felt like I was home, like this place spoke to me. And it sounds like you had that experience when you visited University Park. I did, I did. And you know, one one pusher for me was, uh, my parents were like, if you stay in New York, cause I, I was born in New York, raised in New York, um, in the suburbs, they're like, if you stay in New York, um, you have to live at home. And I was like, okay, that's not happening. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, what states are surrounding um, and right. close by that I could that I could venture off to? <laughs> Absolutely. So you come to University Park. What were you involved in as a student? Um, so I was in a sorority um, where I got involved in Greek Sing and Greek Week on the executive committees, and then I was in um, SMART, which was the student minority minority advisor and recruitment team. And I actually see Jamika, who's here. We were on it together on the executive committee, um, <laughs> and I was the activities co-chair um, for the time that I was there. And it was it was honestly one of the best experiences being in both of um, those organizations. It taught me a lot about about how to function in life. <laughs> Jamika is giving you a shout out in the chat. She says, hi, Ash. Is that when you first realized that you had to schedule tours of campus when you became a smart tour guide? <laughs> yes, I was like, oh, so this is how it works. <laughs> Maybe this is why I didn't get a tour when I just like went knocking on a random building. I don't even know if I went knocking on the right building, to be honest. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. so uh, we're going to talk about your career in just a minute, but as you think back on your time at Penn State, you mentioned Greek Sing. Uh, what was it, uh, in what ways did Penn State prepare you for the career that you have today? Well, you know, when I think about Greek Sing, um, I really wanted to be on the executive committee there as the stage manager because I thought it would actually help me um, in future jobs. This was my um, senior year of of college, so I was like, okay, what can prepare me for that? It genuinely did. That did. Um, I planned Smart's 20th year anniversary um, alumni reunion, um, so we had that um, my senior year of college. And you know, when I went into my first few jobs, um, job interviews, like the things that I talked about the most were the clubs I was involved in and um, events that I planned or things that you know, all the, those logistics that can translate into real life activities in a job, like those were what I talked about. And I think that's how I was able to land a lot of my first few jobs out of college, um, just by being involved in Penn State activities. It's, it's interesting, you bring up SMART. Some of the founders of SMART, some of the founding students are really active with the Alumni Association. Randy Houston is our president. I know Jeff Blue down in DC is doing some great things, a lot of different things as a volunteer down there. I, I believe Daryl Bunridge was involved with that, that group that, that got it started. And so um, you mentioned you were involved with the 20 year, I believe it's now, I believe it's now 30 or 35 years that it's been in existence. And so what a wonderful program here at Penn State. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by artist and creator and producer, Ashley Romaine. Ashley, I know you work in TV and, and video. I'm a little nervous because uh, I'm kind of uh, amateur, amateur host here for somebody who does this uh, or works with people who do this professionally. So I hope you will bear with me as I stumble through uh, this, this production and this interview. Maybe you can give me a critique at the end. You already uh, have the background going, so <laughs> you're, you're steps ahead of me, Paul. <laughs> so uh, you work in many different artistic mediums, video, digital, acrylics, mixed media, pencil. But before we dive into the ways that creativity emanates, let's talk about your passion and where it stems from. Do you remember when that passion was sparked for art for you? You know, I think it was sparked very early. My mom was an artist and she would always be painting in the house. Um, and then we would always be watching Bob Ross and genuinely, you know, I'm like an 80s, 90s kid. So, <laughs> so I would watch Bob Ross endlessly and try to recreate the happy trees and all the different, um, you know, landscapes that he did. Um, and then that moved on to, you know, my parents getting me um, drawing books and just, you know, meticulously like trying to recreate what I saw until I, you know, got like the figure of a person in the right shape. Um, and it was really my parents who honestly pushed me to, to become an artist because I, maybe I had a more real, like realistic version than them. I was like, well, how am I going to make money? <laughs> and they were like, if you're good at it, you'll find a way. So, right. and they were right. I think, you know, I've 
wound up melding a lot of the things that I've, I loved into a career. Um, you earned a BFA from Penn State in 2010. Kind of walk us through your career, uh, your early career as a freelance producer. Okay. Well, as a freelancer, um, you typically work on a project, um, your project base. So, you know, when one show ends, another one begins. Um, and I genuinely actually, I like that because you get to witness a different variety of programming. Um, right out of college, my first two jobs were more in the ad sales um, type of field. I worked at um, a news station, regional news network. It was local in Westchester. And that was in the traffic department where I was working with media buyers and like plotting different um, commercial spots in between programming. Um, then I guess my first big job in production was at the Martha Stewart show. And I was an audience assistant there. And that was like my first like, wow, like I think this could be for me. Um, I had great mentors there who taught me, you know, how to book an audience, which I think most people think like an audience, don't they just show up? But no, you actually have to recruit these people for the amount of shows that, you know, you're taping. And it's a lot of networking. So it taught me how to network. It taught me how to talk to um, people from all different walks of life, from situations and age ranges as well, and how to just start a conversation with someone randomly. <laughs> um, you know, from there, I went to um, a couple different talk shows um, and I worked in the producing department. So I worked on Anderson Live, which was Anderson Cooper's daytime talk show as right. a production assistant. Um, and that was my first, um, I would say, entry level produ like producing type of job. And that was, that was really fun. And then since then I've gone on to do um, a lot of traveling cooking shows, um, which are really fun because you get to eat the food. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and documentary content and talk show content. Uh, an amazing, an amazing career. You tell stories on a wide range of topics from COVID-19 and the Black Panther Party to food and pop culture. Are there genres or topics that bring out the best in you? Well, you know, I think that I really love telling a story. And I think that you can tell a story through a lot of different mediums. Um, you know, I love documentary because you learn a lot. History in high school is one of my favorite subjects. So learning a lot about the history of things really, I think, intrigues me. But then sometimes I just want like fun stuff, you know? So doing food content is, is just a lot of fun. And I, I've always loved cooking too. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's funny that you ask that because at job interviews, I get asked that all the time and I should right. probably have a better answer by now, <laughs> but I genuinely love both. And I don't know if I could ever pick between the two. And I think talk shows also meld um, both of those together, depending on the talk show you're at. So. Well, look, I think we have very similar interests because some of the food work that you have done uh, just has my mouth watering already. I saw the uh, barbecue and brew, uh, burgers, brew and queue. Uh, I went but to I was 52 also, locations, for that, 52 restaurants for that. So you could imagine wow. <laughs> how much burgers and barbecue I had. <laughs> That's amazing. That sounds like a great way to spend uh, 52 52 days. But I was also an undergraduate history major. And so some of the, the documentary style work that you've done is, is also, it's also fascinating to me. Uh, as an artist, it seems like 2020 has been somewhat of a renaissance year for you. Uh, how much of that was inspired by COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, the social justice movement that reignited this spring. Is, is it fair to say that 2020 from an, uh, for you as an artist has been a good year? It really has. You know, I think I, I took, I would say about a 10 year hiatus. I just got back into art really in the very beginning of 2020, right before the pandemic. Um, and I always felt like there was, you know, you start working and sometimes you get lost in the jobs that you're doing, right? But sometimes you need to go back to the basics. Um, so I tried running a marathon, I tried running two, and then I was like, okay, I need something else because I can't do these anymore. <laughs> and so I got back into art and it really, you know, it surprised me how much I 
how much time I actually took off because it, I've been doing it since I was very young. And to take this much time off, I was like, well, this is probably what's missing. So when, you know, quarantine happened, I had a big gift card to Blick Art Store <laughs> and I basically bought up all their supplies. And I was thinking like, what do I want to create? You know, I'm not the type of person who typically likes creating still life art. Um, I always think that there should be some sort of meaning behind whatever you're creating. And I think that's also sometimes what I struggle with and why I wait so long to maybe make a piece because I'm like, it has to have meaning and it has to have meaning to me or the story must have touched me in a certain way. So I think a lot of what's been going on in, in our climate right now that, you know, a lot of it isn't new, um, but it's coming to the forefront. Um, I think you know, that was a story that I was very interesting, interested in relaying through art. Absolutely. A lot going on in 2020, the pandemic, um, the social justice movements, uh, kind of social uh, inequality, um, having a spotlight shown on it, right? Not something new, but, um, but kind of the spotlight in this movement kind of feels different than, than previous ones. Uh, but also, being home and working from home and the impact that food has had on us. And I, I see your food apocalypse series. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about the inspiration behind that. So that was actually the first project. The, these projects were the first ones that I did to get back into art. Um, there's something called the sketchbook project. It's the largest sketchbook museum um, held in Brooklyn. Um, and they send you a sketchbook and you have to fill it back out and then you send it back and then they have it at this museum. And in typical times, not under quarantine, they actually do um, a traveling sketchbook museum. So they'll travel to different locations with it. So I thought it was a really cool and fun project to be a part of and something that like gave me a reason to create something. Cause sometimes I am the type of person who needs like that deadline <laughs> or like, you need to have this invite here or else, you know, I could, I could continue on forever. Um, so, you know, I think when I was filling out that sketchbook, I was like, well, what's speaking to me right now? At the time I was working on a ton of food shows and that's just what really interested me. <laughs> so, you know, one of, one of the drawings there, it's um, like a cake um, pie um, type of drawing that was from, um, a shoot that I did. Um, and we had the owner of the restaurant actually, um, they made this, the bottom layer was, um, an ice cream cake. And then the top was, um, like a confetti birthday cake. So, and I thought it was just such a cool piece of pie <laughs> that I was like, I'm going to draw this now. That's amazing. It's up on the screen right now for our guests to take a look at that. Um, when, when you first came to our attention, I went out and I, and I went uh, onto your online store and I was looking at your art. Uh, and, and admittedly, we do not buy too much art in the Clifford household. So I thought, what, uh, what piece really spoke to me? And, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but it's, um, it's your turtle noodle soup uh, print that we bought. And, and, and I'll tell you why this one spoke to us. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm a sports fan. We play in the Big Ten Conference, and I thought, okay, well, turtle noodle soup, right? Maryland is the Terrapins. Uh, we make turtle soup jokes every once in a while when we play the Terrapins, and so we now have your turtle noodle soup displayed uh, here in, in the Clifford household, but uh, just, uh, just amazing, fascinating art. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed that one. Um, you actually bought, see, maybe it was the hidden Penn State in me that I wasn't even, you know, thinking right. that, but I, I knew to put it down. Um, <laughs> but that was a really fun piece to do too. Cause I was just thinking about like the atypical and the typical. And I was like, well, people talk about turtle noodle soup. So why not, you know, give it more life? <laughs> Absolutely. So you were brought to our attention this summer when NYU Winthrop Hospital selected your essential workers piece. Um, it's, your, it's, it's your essential warriors hospital housekeepers piece to hang in its halls uh, to honor the frontline COVID warriors. And, and when we think of frontline workers, right, we often think of nurses and doctors, but I think what often goes ignored are, are the support personnel around them. And, and you chose to feature them uh, in your art. I'm gonna change my, my background here. 
uh, maybe people will be able to see this piece here. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, tell us about the piece and your feelings about the tribute that your art serves for these workers? Well, you're exactly right, Paul. So, you know, when the pandemic hit in its height, which was around, I would say, March, April, May, um, I don't know if everywhere around the country did this, but New York City did this at 7 p.m. when we everyone would like clap outside of their windows and it was yeah. to honor healthcare workers. But when people do say healthcare workers, a lot of them, you know, mistakenly were always referring to the doctors and nurses who, yes, are definitely, you know, my husband's a doctor, he was taking care of COVID patients. So they, <laughs> they definitely were doing a very difficult and hard job. But I was talking to him one day and I was like, well, what about, you know, the people who are cleaning up the messes, the garbage, the, you know, changing the bed sheets, like no one ever talks about them. So then it drove me to like, just Google online and see if there were like any articles about it. And there were a few, but not as many as you would think. Um, you know, they're called environmental staff, hospital housekeepers. And again, they're the ones, you know, literally, I, if if I might be so blunt, might be the, the most exposed to COVID um, and the right. virus. Um, and I just felt like they were going so unrecognized um, and that, that spoke to me. And then that's why I created this piece. Um, it was really more so to, to honor them. And it was really sweet because, um, you know, a couple of people at um, Winthrop in the environmental department have actually like reached out to me saying that they, you know, never felt like they were recognized before until this piece and they thanked me so much. And like, that's honestly all the payment I need. Like I don't necessarily do art for the, the pay. Um, right. I, I do it because I really enjoy doing it. It's amazing. And, and your personality comes out in your in your art, uh, you know, sometimes you you look at an artist's work, um, and and it's hard because it's just a, it's a static piece in in so many ways, right? Or at least to the untrained eye that that is talking here, it's a static piece. Uh, but I could I could see your personality coming out in in the food art that you've done. I could see what you're passionate about in some of the uh, the quote unquote maybe more serious pieces that you have um that you have done uh i i can see it in the name of your website right your name's ashley romaine and your website is let us roll productions i mean it's uh um uh, it, it's a great play on on your last name uh, is is that uh, is it one way that you kind of let your personality show to the world uh that maybe the tv and digital producing side doesn't give you that platform to do I think so. And then in the same way, it's almost the same, you know, like how I'd said, I love to do food TV, but then I love to do serious documentaries and then talk, you know, and I think that, like you were saying, relays in my art, because there are times where you'll see a lot more serious pieces. And then you'll see, you know, I'm, I'm drawing, you know, a hot dog, you know, coming in from the house, like as an actual human person. So right. I think there's sometimes and I think that's true in life, like, you always have to pay attention to what's going on in the world but there are times that you sometimes just need to um, take a breather from it. And I think um, the food might be more of a breather for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, so we talked about your freelance career uh, and that's moving project to project. And now you have a more, um, a more steady permanent role uh, with the Dr. Oz program. Can you talk a little bit about your role there and uh, about that show? So I'm a producer there. It's my, first season there and I love it. It's um, a talk show. And I think, um, you know, a lot of being a producer just at any show is a lot of script writing. It's, you know, booking talent or guests to come on the show. And then a lot of it is also working in post-production with the editing staff or graphics to, you know, kind of shape the show and make it come together as one cohesive piece. And I would say that's the same around for, for every show that I've worked at. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of celebrity content and obviously health content sure, <laughs> at sure. this specific show. Um, but it's amazing what, you know, everyone's able to do in this, in this new type of normal that we're working in. Um, just because, you know, working for everyone, and I imagine this is true in every career, is just yeah. different in, in quarantine. <laughs> 
So uh, you said that you have a passion for, or, or that you, some of the most fun you've had has been working with some of the celebrity guests. Is there, is there one that stands out in your mind as somebody who was particularly fun or, or interesting to work with? Yes, this was a couple of years ago, but um, I produced Jay Ellis. He was, he's known for being on Insecure. I believe he's going to be on top, one of the Top Guns. Um, but he was such a fun, like lively, nice person to work with. Um, and then I think a really cool person was Zendaya. Um, I produced her as well on yeah. another show and she was really cool. Um, it's, it's more so cool to see how normal celebrities are. Like they're just regular people, right? right. <laughs> but right. We, we, we put them in our heads like there are these like, like different type of people, but they're just so normal. Um, and then I would say most recently, probably um, D.L. Hughley. Um, he he recently wrote a book, um, Surrender White People or Unconditional Terms for Peace. And it really melds his comedy chops in with like serious topics. And I thought it was a really yeah. creative way um, to showcase um, what's going on right now. Absolutely. All right. We have a question from the audience. Jamika Williams wants to know, okay, no no budget constraints, no, there's no constraints on the project, right? What is your dream project either as a producer or an artist? Uh, you know, <laughs> I've been thinking about that lately. And I think my dream project is to what we call in production, like do our own passion project, right? So to do something that's like genuinely just mine, you don't, you don't really have to necessarily answer to anyone, but you create the project and then you can go off and try and sell the project to different networks. And I think that's, um, you know, hopefully within the next few years, something that I'm really um, interested in looking into and doing. Um, right now, I would say it would probably have to be in documentary and it would probably have to be in the arts. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how there's not that many black female artists um, in history that we that everyone really knows about. And even the arts yeah. sometimes is going away for a lot of people as well. Um, so, you know, my, I, I guess my interest would be to find out more about that and produce a documentary on that. Fascinating. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by artist, creator, and producer, Ashley Romaine. All right, Ashley, you said you've watched Coffee Hour before. We like to have a little bit of fun at the end of Coffee Hour. So we're gonna do a lightning round here. I'm just gonna throw a bunch of questions at you and you share what pops uh, pops to mind first. Your favorite Penn State memory? I don't know if this is my favorite, but it's the one that I remember the most. It it was, um, I was traveling back to Penn State either, um, it was for, from spring break or Christmas break, and I had accidentally went a day early. So I was on the bus from New York City and, you know, traveling back and only realized that the dorms weren't opening for another day. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was freaking out. I was calling people. No one was, no one that I knew, because um, remember, I was a freshman. I didn't know that many people. Right, right. <laughs> no one that I knew was at campus. Um, and I was like, oh my God, where am I going to stay? I, I spent all of my uh, money on <laughs> food. <laughs> so right, I don't right. money. You know, we're freshmen. You don't have money for a hotel. Um, so there was this girl in front of me and she offered for me to stay with her at her apartment. And I, at first I was like, hmm, is this the thing that my parents always warned me about? Like, don't go home with strangers. <laughs> right. <laughs> but like, she was so sweet, so nice, so genuine. Um, and like to this day, I'll never forget like that nice gesture because it really showed what type of a person like Penn State people are. Right. Uh, they're genuinely nice people. This is, uh, did it click? This is how most horror stories start, right? You know, <laughs> you know what, now it, it clicks that it could have wound up that way. Right. But I didn't watch that many documentaries back then. So, so I was like, hmm. This could be questionable, but like, you know, I, I feel like I can tell a person's character very quickly by sure. you know, talking to them um, in a short period of time, um, which is actually a very good trait for a producer. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I just felt like she was she was going to be an OK, a good person. <laughs> I don't I don't know if this is a similar experience, but we had something kind of in that genre of things happen to us. We showed up at Disney a day before our vacation was to start. And, uh, and we had a scramble to find the place. We walked in and we're 
we drove and and they're like great we're expecting you tomorrow <laughs> so um a, a little different than being 18 19 years old and and not knowing where you were going to stay how about your favorite class at penn state that would have to be fitness walking <laughs> i just i thought it was <laughs> They gave us a little pedometer and I was like, oh, I'm going to, I like took it like very competitively. Like I tried to beat out everyone in the class and you have to get low to, you know, really do your best. So right. to this day, I'll like fitness walk through the streets of Astoria to embarrass my husband. And he's like, please stop that. I'm like, hey, so I funny. learned a lot from Penn State. <laughs> so uh, you produce TV, you produce documentaries, but what do you enjoy to watch? Um. You know, I really, I like a lot of scripted shows. Um, right now I've been watching, well, this isn't scripted, The Vow, which is a documentary um, about a cult. Um, Nurse Ratchet is really good. That's oh, on yeah. Netflix. Um, my all time favorite show is Survivor. <laughs> so okay. I've been I've been rewatching the seasons over and over because I've been watching it since I was 11. Um, right. It's just like one of, one of my all time favorite shows. Oh, that's interesting. Have you ever thought about trying out I did try out. <laughs> okay. Uh, tell, us, tell us about that. Tell us about that. I did try out. Um, they flew me to LA and I went through a couple of rounds and it was a really cool experience just to be on the other side. Um, Cause normally I'm on, you know, the side that's maybe casting people to come on a show. Um, right. But it was really interesting and I wound up not getting it at the end of the day, but it was really cool to see like some of the people that I were, was um, with who were, who wound up being on the show. Who knows? Maybe it's I'll try out again. <laughs> it's amazing. I had a friend who was on Survivor and he lasted, he was probably down to the final five or six. Uh, a guy named Ron Clark uh, from probably about two or three seasons ago. Uh, really interesting guy. He's a Disney teacher of the year or was a Disney teacher of the year. He won the prices right. And then was on, and then was on Survivor. He, the guy lives a charmed life. So, <laughs> um, so if you could have dinner with anybody besides one of your family members, who would it be and why? It might be in, instead of one of my family members. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, it would have to be Michelle Obama. I mean, I know that's probably oh, yeah. a typical type of answer, but after reading her book, Becoming, and then going to um, one of her book, to book tours in Philadelphia, like she really spoke to me and felt like a human too. You got to understand her story and she didn't right. feel so almost far away from you. Yeah. So I want to go back to a previous answer uh, because I'm, I'm reminded of it. So Nurse Ratchet um, is the is the prequel to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, right? Yes. Uh, and I have, uh, I had not read the book. I'm, I'm currently actually in the middle of reading One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I mentioned to you off off air. My daughter is a freshman at the University of Oregon. Ken Kesey uh, is, is an Oregon grad. He's uh, kind of, uh, his um, spirit is prominent within, uh, within Eugene. Uh, and, and he's obviously the, uh, the writer of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, and I am struck. I have not, I, I'm reading it so that I can then watch Nurse Ratchet on, on uh, so I can stream that. Uh, but I am struck by the the racial the racial overtones in the book. I'm not sure if you've had the chance to compare and contrast the book, which was written in the the 60s um, 70s time frame, um, and the way that they address uh, people's racial backgrounds in the book is not something that we would do in a uh, in a fiction the way we would write a fiction today. I'm, um, I'm reacting really strongly to it because it's just so, it's just so out of place. I haven't read the book, but this is making me want to read the book now. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Abs you should absolutely read it. it. It's probably, I'm doing it the, I'm doing it the opposite way that you're doing it. I'm reading One Floor is the Cuckoo's Nest so I can watch Nurse Ratchet. You could watch the prequel and have it like lead you into yeah. um one flew over so sometimes reading um, the book ruins the show for you because it you know shows can only tell so much in so little time um right <laughs> so um what is your most unusual we are moment you know people talk about traveling the world and penn staters being everywhere 
but the unexpected kind of we are that catches you off guard? Um, you know, I don't know if I have the most unexpected. I think when I first graduated from college and came back to the city and was working in the city, I was actually really surprised to see a lot of people just walking around in like Penn Station. Penn State shirts, um, which I thought was really cool. I just thought it, I wouldn't have saw that because um, it was New York City and not Pennsylvania. Um, but it, it, you know, it always brings you a little bit of joy inside when you see someone walking by with, with a shirt. Absolutely. How about your favorite Penn State sport? Um, probably football, mostly for the camaraderie. I'm not a big sports person. I know, right. don't, That's <laughs> don't. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> but um, you know, I think it bought a lot of people at the school together. Absolutely. And your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? I would say chocolate chip cookie dough. Chocolate chip cookie dough. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we have, um, uh, that is all the time that we have today. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us on Coffee Hour. What a fascinating career that you've had. Uh, the, the art that you create is uh, is wonderful and, and inspiring to so many. And I'm just glad that you came on and, and shared your story and shared your art with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Paul. And thank you to everybody who has tuned in. If you're a member of the Alumni Association, thank you for your support. If not, head out to our website at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. From all of us here at the Penn State Alumni Association to all of you, we wish you all a happy Thanksgiving and we thank you for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State. <laughs>